gospel. What a glorious time. Singing praise to God this morning. Norman, I appreciate you showing the SM Lockridge clip. I was actually, had the privilege of being present one of the times that he preached that message. Uh, and he got up and said, before he preached it, he said, I forgot to ask, this was at a convention that we were at, he said, I forgot to ask the president what the shouting level is in this auditorium. Because he had an entourage of pastor friends there. And uh, he had a, a gift describing our king. We come today to study the king in his agony. His agonies are beginning. We looked last week at how he transformed Passover into communion or the Lord's Supper or Eucharist, whatever term you want to assign. All those are valid. Now he goes into his agony. We're going to start studying that today. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. We're going to read verses 26 to 42 as we think about Jesus' agony in Gethsemane. I want you to stand with me if you would. Stand with me if you would as we uh, read from the Word of God. Follow along. I have it on the screen if you don't have your Bible with you. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane. He said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. The Scripture teaches us that we are most like the Lord Jesus Christ when we serve and when we suffer for Him. Behold today, as we study these passages in the, in the days to come, the suffering servant of Jehovah. Please be seated. He is just acknowledged to them in the upper room that one is dipping his hand, the, the, the bread into the cup with him and will betray him. And the betrayer leaves the room. We've been showing you on Sunday evenings that is when Judas exits the room that Jesus teaches some deep uh, transformational truths designed, designed to finish up the work he's been doing in them to prepare them to be disciple makers. And they finish that Lord's Supper celebration and the text tells us they sang a hymn. 
and went out. It was, it was traditional to sing a hymn at the conclusion of Passover. In fact, I told you last week that the Hallel Psalms, Psalm 113 through Psalm 118, were sung throughout the meal. I encourage you to read that sometime during the week. And then they go to the garden, Gethsemane. I want you to see in this text, we'll, we'll begin it this morning, finish it up, Lord willing, next Sunday. First of all, a warning and a word of hope. Secondly, a sincere promise and a sober prediction. Third, Jesus' agony begins in Gethsemane. Fourth, Jesus is abandoned in the midst of his agony. This warning, mixed with the word of hope, they, they, sang, they sang a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives. And so on the Mount of Olives, there is this garden. It's a place called Gethsemane. They would go into it where they could be alone. When he gets there, he warns them. You will all fall away. Some, some uh, translations, you will be offended by me. For my sake. You will all fall away. For it is written, and he quotes Zechariah 13, 7, which says, Awake, O sword. Johnny, if you want to, we can go with this pulpit mic. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will will be scattered. In other words, he is telling them here that they are going to fall away. That's their sin, but it's going to be in fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah. We've told you before, you're going to see this, and you should have seen it throughout the gospel, but as we, as we come to the cross, there are things that happen that are a direct fulfillment of prophetic utterance hundreds of years before, and though they fulfill them, they themselves are guilty of acting in that way. tragic warning. You're going to abandon me. What's coming is going to be so intense and so awful that you will remove yourself from the danger of experiencing anything like it with me. And then there's a word of hope. Verse 28, But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Now I submit to you, and I, as we think about it, what do you learn from, from these couple of verses here? That they, they didn't, I don't think they heard anything after you will fall away. <laughs> But what do, we, what do we learn today that should give us hope and comfort and encouragement and instruction as followers of Jesus Christ? Well, I want you to see here how our Lord foreknew, He knew ahead of time the weakness and shortcomings of His disciples. These are the twelve, really, really the eleven. They've been with him. They've logged more hours with him than anyone else on the earth at that time. He's taught them secretly. He's explained things to them that no one else had the explanations to. They've been inside homes when he's performed incredible miracles. They've been with him on the road when, when miraculous occurrences have taken place. He chose them. And he foreknew. But I want you to be encouraged today, brothers and sisters, that knowing that ahead of time did not prevent his choosing them to be the twelve.
He allowed them into that inner circle. He allowed them to be intimate friends, companions. And he knew exactly what they would do when this time came. I want you to be comforted in the thought that Jesus does not cast off his children, his followers, because of failures and imperfections. If he did, none of us could stand. If he did, none of us would remain. If he did, none of us would continue. If he did, none of us would have the hope that when we leave this earth, heaven is our home. He knows us. He knew us before He saved us. He takes us as our loving husband and loves us, blemishes and all. He is for us a merciful and compassionate high priest. He will pray not too many hours from now. What we have recorded in John 17. I pray for them. Father, my desire is that those whom you have given me be with me where I go. You see, he passes over our transgressions because he is our Passover who has borne our sin for us. He covers our sins because His blood paid the penalty for our sins. Think about this. He knew what you were before you were saved. He knew what these disciples were before they were saved. They were wicked. They were guilty. They were defiled. Before I was saved, I was wicked, guilty, and defiled. And if you're honest, so were you. Yet he loved them. And he loves us. He knew what they would be after conversion. Weak, airy, frail, fumbling. Falling, failing. Yet he loved them. He knew what you would be after he saved you. That you would disappoint. That you would struggle, you would stumble. Yet he loves. One of the songs Joshua has taught us is, Oh, how He loves us. Oh, how He loves us so. He came to save them and He came to save you and me. And I think one of the things that happens and for some is some people have the notion, I may even be speaking to someone here today who think you have to somehow earn a right to be saved by him or perhaps you've got to I got to get my life together before he can save me that is just not true and here's here's why dear unconverted friend because none of us who are saved have our lives together that's one of the devil's lies if, if you wait until then you will perish in hell he saves us just as we are and he he comes by His Spirit to change us and make us new. And see, one of the things I struggle with, I'll be honest with you. I struggle with it in my own life sometimes. And I struggle with it in the lives of people who profess to be saved. I struggle with the temptation to give up on them. I found this in J.C. Ryle's. Expository thoughts on the gospel. Listen to this. He's commenting on this passage here. Let us learn to pass a charitable judgment on the conduct of professing believers 
Let us not set them down in a low place and say that they have no grace because we see in them much weakness and corruption. Let us remember that our master in heaven bears with their infirmities and let us try to bear with them too. The church of Christ is little better than a great hospital. We ourselves are all more or less weak and all daily need the skillful treatment of the heavenly physician. There will be no complete cures till the resurrection day. J.C. Ryan. That is so important to remember. Because I promise you, had we, or had, I'm not going to put this on you, had I been observing what was about to happen in the garden, I would have written every one of them off. When you put the gospel records together, and we're going we're to look at this a little more later, and he tells Peter what he's going to do. Peter <laughs> vehemently denies it. And then, not long after that, vehemently denies him. Jesus says, but when you return, I don't think Peter heard that either. Listen, he just told him, you're going to fall away because of me. But after I am raised up. See, there's the word of hope. We need to be honest. Have an honest assessment of ourselves. Not making excuses for sin. Because he's taught them already. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. Better to enter heaven maimed with one eye than hell with two eyes. He's already made very clear instructions to them. To lay the axe at the root of sin. This is not an excuse for sin. What it is, is an acknowledgement of that as long as we live on this decaying earth in this decaying tabernacle of clay, we will battle remaining sin. The operative word there is battle. But the ultimate reality is remaining sin. And sometimes because we, we forget that this is all about grace, we take on a pharisaical tone Overlooking the reality of ourselves and looking down our noses at others. I, I do it, folks, and I, I hate it when I see it in myself. I hate it. We call one another to the standard. Putting ourselves first. We should be ruthless dealing with our own sin and we should be compassionate. Dealing with the sins of others. I fear sometimes we just the other way around. We want to be compassionate about our sin. And we want to be ruthless with the sins of others. And that's not what Jesus teaches you. He loves us. Another thing I want you to see here is. How when we do not hear him. I appreciated Josh you know, saying let's, let's listen. The scripture teaches. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. And I promise you, one of the things we hate is silence. You don't believe me? What's your attitude when you're put on hold? Now, if we, if we think like we ought to think, we'd go... Wow, I sure wanted to get to them earlier, but this is a great opportunity to commune. Let all the earth be silent before Him. Commune with God in your heart and be still. We hate silence. I recognized this in myself years ago, and I would like to tell you that when I made so much strive, but I, I don't know. When I picked up a habit, I... I, I would walk in the house. This is years and years ago now. Walk in the house and turn the TV on. And it wasn't because of what was on TV. I didn't have, I didn't have a clue what was on TV. I discovered it was just background noise. And yet, how, do we, how are we going to hear the still, small voice if we don't 
plug in into our lives. What I think Don Whitney calls it, uh, silence and solitude. Well, they didn't hear this. They did not hear him say, but after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And when you don't hear that, you rob yourself of consolation. He spoke plainly then, after I'm raised. All they heard was you're going to fall away. And then when the heat was turned up, and we're going to look at this narrative in the, in the Sundays to come, and they did come to arrest him, they did exactly that thing. They ran. And they did not run to make plans to meet him in the resurrection. In fact, if you read the gospel accounts, when they were told he had risen, they didn't believe. They'd been with him three to three and a half years. And you would think, well, if anybody would have taken him at face value at everything he said, it would have been these folks. And yet the text tells us no. How human we are. We see the very same things in ourselves today. We read truths in the Bible. Some read the Bible through every year, yet don't remember them as if we hadn't read them at all. James says it's like looking in a mirror and forgetting what we see. How many words have you heard in a sermon that you couldn't repeat them an hour later? Now, you can forget my words. But the words of Scripture, the words of truth. And see, these are given to us. Paul said in Romans that everything that was written beforehand was written for us, that, that through, the, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures we might have hope. And, and the psalmist said that your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And yet, when we don't retain the word, when we don't hang on to it, when it doesn't grip us, then, then when the squeeze comes and the time comes and the trial comes, it's as if we'd never heard them. What we ought to do is pray. I hope when you gather here, as you're making plans to come here, that you're praying, Lord, quicken your word to my heart today, whether it is read, whether it's preached, whether it's taught, Lord, whether it's sung, quicken this to my heart. Give me understanding. Give me application. Help me to walk changed. And this, by the way, will stand us well when the trials come. This will, this will be light to guide us in ever increasingly dark days. Brothers and sisters, if you're paying attention to the news at all, we as a nation are in deep, deep trouble. We have no one that we can choose for a president with any conscience at all. You tell me I shouldn't vote? No, you need to, you need to, you need to do, your, do your diligence. We have two utterly vile people to choose from. And their alternatives are milk toast. We're heading into days. It's so obvious that God is judging this nation by the wicked people that are going to be served up to us to be our leaders. We're heading into days. They're going to be the darkest days this nation has ever faced. We better have the word gripping us, shaping us, molding us, leading us, guiding us, the Spirit breathing into what we know. And brothers and sisters, here's the key. It being in this book will not do us any good if it doesn't come off the pages of this book into our minds and gripping our hearts and shaping our, our wills and our choices. We see this. Jesus said, 
after I am risen. And they did not hide that in their hearts. And it did not stand them well when the heat was turned on and our Savior is arrested in the garden, mocked before Herod, mocked before Pilate, beaten beyond recognition, nailed to a cross. So, let us be not like others who hear the word and forget it. Let us take the consolations of the scripture. Those passages, first of all, that would pierce our hearts and rebuke us and challenge us to be more increasingly conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And then those passages that comfort us and encourage us and assure us that he is with us always, even to the end of the age, even if the nation we have loved goes to hell in a handbasket. Jesus is with us. He's with his people. He's with his church. And will be with us through this all. But if we don't have that, that's in here, in here, and in here, we will fall away. May it not be so of us. My heart's desire for myself and for you is in the coming national holocaust. In the absence of anyone remotely moral to lead us. That we will be by God's grace and many like us the spiritual paramedics to take us through this crisis. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you in the name of him who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Who is, when all is said and done, when we've emptied our vocabulary, we've ransacked the scriptures, who is, who is beyond our capacity to describe adequately. Yet we're thankful to know that he is the willing and able Savior of sinners. Father, I'm thankful today that that Jesus knew me before he ever saved me and saved me in spite of that. I'm thankful that he knew me, he knew what I would be after I was saved and he saved me in spite of that and I'm thankful for that. And, and I pray for any today here who are under the delusion that somehow they've got to get it all together, they've got to clean up their act, they've got to get qualified. Father, convince those here who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ that all the fitness that you require is for them to feel their need of a Savior and to recognize that even that sense of felt need you have given to them. For those of us who are followers of Christ, help us, help me, Lord, to be brutal with my remaining sin and to be kind, loving, compassionate like my Savior toward others who profess to be Christians and yet who have infirmities and weakness and frailties and remaining sin and besetting sin. Help me, Lord. And then help us to hear your word, not forget it. And to prepare to walk in the light when everything goes dark in this culture. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.